Okay, I think we'll we'll make a start and then people will join us as as we go through the the webinar. But uh, thank you ever so much for joining us uh, this morning. Um, my name is Howard Cordingly and I work for GrowthWorks. Um, I'm the Skills and Business Relationship Manager with GrowthWorks. And uh, today is all about demystifying the, the knowns and the unknowns about apprenticeships. There's so many um, employers and individuals out there who simply just have no idea about how apprenticeships work. Um, and we're, hope, we're hoping today to try and break down those barriers and uh, make it a bit more easy to understand for wow. employers and for indi individuals who want to do an apprenticeship. Now, before we go any further, um, I'd just like to say that the, the presentation has been recorded and uh, we're quite happy to share the slides after the webinar with uh, anybody that uh, would like uh, more more information about the slides as well. Um, could I ask also if you have your mics on, if you could um, put your mics to off mode just uh, while the presentation is taking place. And at the end of the presentation, when the, when the guests presented of uh, doing the presentations, then we'll we'll open the floor up to any questions and answers. If there's any questions where we can't find the answers today, hopefully there won't be, but if there is, then we, we will go away and we'll try and get those answers for you. And we'll come back to you um, with the, the answers that you require. But thank you very much for joining us today. I know you're, you're, you've got busy lives and uh, it's uh, very good of you to give up this uh, hour of your time, but hopefully at the end of this hour, you'll have a bit more knowledge about apprenticeships and how they can benefit you and your business. Uh, next slide, please. So who are we? Well, GrowthWorks, um, we've, we're based in Peterborough. We're contracted to support businesses, uh, individuals, business startups across the whole of the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority. Um, we're a brokerage service and we, I, I like to say to employers and Individuals, we we where the we are the, the the people who join the dots together and introduce businesses to training providers and uh, individuals to our in, inward investment team who help businesses to uh, apply for grants to, uh, to 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 get their business off the ground. Um, we like to we're in we're an impartial service and uh, part of our ethos is that uh, we, we want to be open to anybody who wants to grow their business or upskill their workforce and, and we try and work also with local providers who work with people who are looking for employment um, through the job centres as well so we're trying to reach out to the communities at, at every level and um, I, I was in retail management once and I like to think of this as a single shop window. It's a one stop shop where anybody can drop in onto our website and get all of the information and advice that they require, uh, regardless of whether they're an employer, um, a sole trader or an individual looking for employment because we do have our own free recruitment service as well on the website. Could I have the next slide, please? So, as I mentioned earlier, we like to link up employers with schools and colleges to showcase our uh, careers and sectors. We have our um, uh, enterprise coordinators who work for uh, GrowthWorks and they work in the local schools and uh, colleges where they work with young people who are trying to um, to get on the career ladder, whether it's apprenticeships or go to university. Um, our enterprise coordinators work with uh, young people and, and, and local schools. So we've got a very large footprint across the region and the work that, did, that they, they do is very valuable. Um, part of our service that they offer is they offer advice and guidance to, to young people about their important career choices, whether they are uh, studying for next year or they, they, they've just left school and they're not too sure what to do. Our, our enterprise coordinators will give them advice and we'll also link up young people with our employer network that we work with because we do try to uh, make sure we're working with um, employers who are recruiting and we try and encourage employers to recruit young people to who are just on the first step of the ladder uh, to their career. 
We have a range of uh, events taking place um, throughout the, throughout Cambridgeshire. We work very closely with Formula Future, um, who are based in Cambridge, and they work with lots of schools across the region and the universities and the colleges. So we have got a, a strong network of um, links with schools and colleges. And the next slide, please. So who are we? Well, uh, we like to get more people involved in training and development. So um, we like to feel that the, the services that we offer to, to businesses, uh, to communities, will have an impact on, uh, on individuals and, and the communities where they live and work. As you can see on there, I, I won't read every every uh, section on there, but um, you can see the key word there is really that we are we're trying to help employers to to fill their vacancies, to upskill their workforce, um, and to also recruit uh, young people onto apprenticeships. But apprenticeships are not just for young people, and that's what today's uh, webinar is about today. Because we all, we also want to let those employers are on the call um, to know that we can upskill your existing workforce. I'm, I'll, I'm going to put, I'll, I'll going to give you my age. I'm 68. I work, I worked for Cambridge Regional College and um, in 2014, I did an apprenticeship and that, that goes to show that you can do an apprenticeship at any age. Um, so if people come to me and say, I'm too old to do an apprenticeship, well, they, they have a tough argument with myself because I would just say that age isn't a problem. So I'm trying, we're trying to break down the myth about apprenticeships that uh, 16 to 18 year olds or 16 to 24 years will go to college is what an apprenticeship is about, but it's not. It's, it's totally different. You can do apprenticeships now up to uh, postgraduate level, um, degree level. So, um, but as you can see there, um, we're uh, working with um, uh, young people who are inspired and work ready. Um, we, we, we want, to, uh, we want to engage with more young people as well, of course, um, to help them to find a career path, whether it's apprenticeships or going to university. As I, get, as I said, we're running partial service. Could I have the next slide, please? If you are a business and you want to uh, uh, find out more about uh, apprenticeships and skills um, and general upskilling of your workforce, we have a, um, a really fantastic tool. It's called the TDMI, which is a Talent Development Maturity Index. Sounds quite grand, actually, but um, I, we, we, we call it as TDMI. And it's really good. It's a, it's a very good online diagnostic tool that um, your organisation can use to um, identify where, where, there are, where there are gaps in your, your training, uh, your people data, HR um, uh, resources. And it takes, um, it takes 50 minutes to complete this. Uh, um, it's a uh, training needs analysis, but um, I did it myself and I did it um, in, in 10 minutes. So it's, it's, it's quite quick, but it will give you a um, uh, an outcome at the end of the, uh, the analysis uh, of where your company stands with regard to your HR functions, your training and development, your people data, recruitment, performance management and resilience as well. So uh, if you do log on to our website, I would encourage you to uh, register your business as a business profile and then complete the TDMI. And, and then we will then reach out to you, uh, myself or my colleagues, reach out to you then to go through the T TDMI in a bit more detail and put together an action plan for you where we feel uh, your, your, your business needs some support. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so there, it's uh, just break, really breaking down what I just said, really. It's a HR function, what the structure and focus of your HR function is, how strategic or transactional are they in their focus, um, training, what purpose does training serve? Is it linked to appraisals, company strategy, or, or just compliance? Uh, performance management, nobody likes poorly performing teams, but is, is your organization simply addressing poor performance or is it actively promoting excellent performance? Recruitment, do your methods of recruitment vary? Are you stuck using old methods? How do you attract the talent that you need? And the people data, how do, do, you, do you collect and use in, information about your team? Is this for monitoring or for action? And, and to what extent does people data influence your 
longer term company strategy, whether it's the next two to three years or the next 10 years. And resilience, do you have business continuity in place or are you at risk of losing critical skills? Very often, when I speak to employers, um, they've got very good retention rate. They're, they've got a thriving workforce, the business is doing well. But un unfortunately, some employers don't think ahead and don't, they don't think about the next five years or the next 10 years about when their aging workforce starts to retire. They need to be thinking about um, bringing in new blood to train up and to progress into the roles when your, your existing workforce um, retire or change careers. So um, we look at this as part of the uh, TDMI um, um, uh, analysis that we do with you. Uh, the next slide, please. Now apprenticeships, the benefits of apprenticeships. 96% um, of employers with apprentices have experienced at least one benefit from taking on an apprentice, and most can count at least eight benefits. And there are people on, on the call today who will probably confirm this as well. Um, upskill um, existing employees through apprenticeships equals a highly skilled workforce. If, you, if you've got a highly skilled workforce, you have got a competitive workforce and that, that gives your business a competitive competitive edge against your your competitors so it's very important to keep your your workforce um, truly upskilled and and looking longer term as part of their uh, learning and development plans um, as i just mentioned apprentices can form part of an employer succession planning and apprenticeships uh, not only bring essential skills to your business but training your existing staff through the levy is also brilliant for retention um, I look after the levy for Cambridgeshire for any apprenticeships that are taking place uh, uh, under the combined authority. So if employers um, want to tap into the apprenticeship levy, um, and there's a, a generous funding available for apprenticeships now, 95% um, funded, um, possibly 100% funded in some cases, and we have some employers who are willing to share their levy, which they're not using, with with uh, smaller employers, so we can we can help to facilitate that um, and introduce you to employers who are willing to share their levy with any other business. And and it's very simple to apply for the levy. It's it's a, it's a very streamlined uh, process and um, takes a matter of uh, a couple of weeks to do this. And and then also, very often staff who are doing apprenticeships or doing any of other form of training increase increases job satisfaction. Because they they like to feel that they are wanted, that their 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 the skills are being invested invested in, and and it motivates the workforce. And you'll you will then find obviously that you'll have a, a more um, productive workforce who are very satisfied in their jobs. And the next slide, please. Some of the key take takeaways really is uh, ben uh, apprenticeships do fill the skill gaps that your uh, business has and uh, our TDMI, which I mentioned earlier, would, would outline where the skill gaps are. Um, and again, that's going to give your business a competitive advantage. Um, improving retention by upskilling your existing work workforce, um, by also uh, enrolling young people onto uh, apprenticeships as part of your succession planning. We do work with lo uh, a number of local colleges and local training providers. Um, so we've got a range of expert training providers who can offer a, a really good range of apprenticeships. There's over 600 apprenticeship standards across the UK that um, are available to any uh, any businesses across every sector. Um, also creating talent for the future by investing in today's apprenticeship opportunities. That's another benefit of um, um, turning to apprenticeships for your for your business. And, and grants are available if you employ 16 to 18 year olds onto a recognized apprenticeship. So if you um, employ a, per a person in this age group, 16 to 18, uh, your business will be entitled to a full funding for the apprenticeship, but they'll also attract a 1,000 pound grant that can be paid in two installments, which is 500 pound after the first 90 days. And then uh, the, the, the other 500 pounds uh, when once we've completed 365 days on the apprenticeship. And that, that uh, funding can be used towards uh, their travel costs, uniform, um, other related costs to, to uh, help them to uh, complete their apprenticeship. 
Also, employers can get, um, get the employer's national insurance contribution waived whilst they are having an apprenticeship age 16 to 24. A lot of employers don't realise this. Very easy to set up. The uh, HMRC have a, 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 a link where you can go on to there and your finance team or your accountant or your payroll departments should be able to help you to access this. Whilst they're on the apprenticeship and they're in that age group, they employ secondary national insurance is, is wavered. And that can save you a few hundred pounds each year. And I, I said to my employers I work with, well, this money you're getting back or you're saving, why not offer that to your apprentice as incentives for them to complete their apprenticeship at, at certain milestones during the, during the course of the year? So you're giving, incent, you're incentivizing your apprentice, but you're also giving them something back as well, and and it's helping you to um, to develop, to develop a, a very good apprentice that's going to benefit your business. So longer term, it's a good investment for yourself. And the next slide, please. Right, I'm going to uh, test to make sure you're all alive and awake. So I'm going to ask you a question now. And um, between August 22 and April 23, how many apprenticeship starts were there? Now I'd like you to, has anybody got any idea? Would you like to take a guess? You, you can unmute your mics now and just um, have a guess um, or pop it into the chat if you don't want to speak up. And so was it 140,908? 305,687, 275,630. Oh, so George just said 140. Have we got any more offers? Any more ups or downs? Richard? Uh, I would say 275, Howard. Uh, and I think Kerry says 275. Anna Stevens, 305. 275. 275, right. Um, could we have the next slide, please, to find, oh, 275 again. Can we have the next slide to find out what the true figure is? Wow. So those of you who uh, got uh, 275, then you're, you're spot on there. So um, it, it's that's that's really surprising. Has it surprised anybody? Anybody uh, like to comment on that? Excellent. Thank you. So we've got no. Um, I do think it shows we're healing from COVID and apprenticeships are getting back out into industry. I think you're right, Kerry, because the um, during COVID uh, apprenticeship starts uh, really dropped, and and it had an effect on businesses across across the UK, but apprenticeships as well, and um, it was slow to to return from COVID. And uh, and that, that's a really good point, Kerry, because it, it, it shows that we are recovering uh, from COVID and uh, that the uh, uh, employers are, and my, my diary now is getting busier and busier because employers are, are realizing the benefits of apprenticeships and the, and the co and your college, um, your, your starts are obviously increasing as well, aren't they, at CRC, Kerry? Uh, yes, so, this month alone, we're only 35 off of last year in total. Wow, that's, that's not bad then, really. That's very good. So, uh, right, we've got another question to come up before I hand over to my colleagues. Could you have the next slide, please? What percentage of under 19s are accounted for those apprenticeship starts? So, is it 63% for under 19, 24% uh, or 78%? This is a really good one. Nearly caught me out. George, 63. OK. Kerry, 63. OK. I actually got this one right when I was given this question a couple of weeks ago. I'm not showing off, by the way, but uh, Hannah Stevens, 63. Dennis, 24. Any more offers? Folks, OK, we'll go to the next slide then. And I, I actually got this right. I was quite shocked, really, but I, I, I had a feeling it would be that. But uh, so that's quite what do, what do people feel about this? Um, do you feel because some of you said 63, 78. Um, are you quite surprised? Any any comments on that? Um, we've got one hand up. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't put my hand up. No, you're okay. Um, don't worry. I think it probably uh, it would suggest that the perhaps the higher level apprenticeships for existing members of staff are, are quite prevalent within organisations as well as those more entry level positions. Yeah, yeah that's a good point actually. And uh, Hannah, I think you put your hand up, didn't you? Yeah, thanks, Howard. Um, I think it also demonstrates that people are starting apprenticeships all through their careers, um, similar to the last contributor, um, and that young people, i.e. those under 19, are perhaps looking at all a wide variety of career options available to them. So university apprenticeships and other things as well. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a good point, actually. And, and I think that um, with with um i won't drag on too much because i know time's going now but uh, but that that figure i do think it would be 24 percent because like you said there are other options that uh, younger people are, are looking at but i think it's really encouraging that the uh, over 19s um that 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 percentage is growing and there's a growing number of um employed people who are taking up higher apprenticeships level four five upwards as well so uh, which isn't a bad thing that's a good thing um, but we need to see more uh, an increase in level three apprenticeships as well, because I think that's where there's a, um, a, a need to get more people onto level threes. There's a few level two apprenticeships around still, but they tend to be level threes now. But thank you ever so much for that. Uh, um, and I think, Dennis, you got that one right, didn't you? I think you, you said 24. So if I could give you a prize, I'll give you a prize, but uh, I haven't got anything today. But for, well done anyway. Um, could we have the next slide, please? And the now this is a, a interesting one. This is the last question. What is the percentage of time dedicated to off the job training for an apprentice? So every apprentice has to have a certain amount of time devoted to their apprentice apprenticeship. It doesn't mean they actually have to be taken off the job as such, but they have to devote so many hours per week towards their apprenticeship. So what was that? Um, oh, 20 percent, Megan. OK, well, what was Dennis's? Dennis just said again. Richard Siddle, 20. Kerry, 20. Hannah Stevens, 20. Oh. Dennis, 40. OK. Um, Kathleen, 20. And in the chat. Uh, oh, yes, we've got. Uh, excellent. So for those who said 20%, you're spot on. So. 20% of the uh, time an apprentice should spend on their apprenticeship each week. Um, it should be roughly around about six hours. The, the revised it now, it's about six hours a week. The, it doesn't mean they actually have to be taken off the job, but they, there could be you know, a range of other tasks and duties um, that can count towards that 20% off the job, but it needs to be shown as evidence to show that they're, they're working through that apprenticeship. But uh, thank you ever so much for that. and. Um, uh, you know, it's good to see that most people went for the correct one on that, even though they were training providers, but uh, they should know, shouldn't they really? But uh, thank you very much. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? And that's that's my presentation over. So uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to introduce you to uh, George, who's the National Recruitment Manager for Paragon Skills, and um, he's going to explain to you about everything from recruitment of apprenticeships to the onboarding of apprentices and and what paragon skills do so i'll, I'll hand over to george now, but thanks everybody for your support so far thanks howard hi everyone uh yeah as howard mentioned uh my name's george marsh i am the apprentice recruitment manager um at paragon skills i'll tell you a bit about myself first of all so quite an interesting ground in, in apprenticeship so I previously worked for a different training provider. I was there for around seven years. I actually started as an apprentice at that training provider. Um, before the levy came in, I did my sales level two NVQ, and then I did my business administration NVQ level three. Um, so I've got, it was interesting because I was really able to, to resonate with the people that I was speaking with. Um, during my time with that training provider, I went from an apprentice to recruitment coordinator to a senior, then up to a team leader, um, sort of managing a team of recruiters, helping to uh, get young people onto the uh, get their first step on the employment ladder. 
Um, I'm now at Paragon Skills, so they've recently brought their apprentice recruitment service in-house and they've asked me to launch that from their perspective. Um, at Paragon Skills, we have been rated the UK's number one training provider twice uh, by Rate My Apprenticeship. We support approximately 6,000 learners um, and around 1,000 uh, employers. We do work across a number of different sectors as well that I'll highlight further on as we go in, uh, in my couple of slides that I've got to show you all. Um, if I could get the next slide, please. Lovely, perfect. So first of all, in terms of the process, so from start to finish, what does the process look like um, from an employer's perspective if you're recruiting an apprentice through Paragon Skills? So the headline sort of on this is very simple and straightforward from an employer's perspective. Paragon will do all the legwork. Um, we'll, we'll speak to the candidates, we'll book the interviews, we'll do all the email confirmations. All the employer really has to do is identify a suitable vacancy, which they can do with help um, from a colleague here at Paragon Skills, identifying which role would be suitable for an apprentice to go into, which department, um, how many hours per week it is, that kind of thing. Um, so they would identify the vacancy. We would then create that bespoke uh, vacancy advert and advertise it across various national job boards, um, including the National Apprenticeship Service, which is the sort of .gov website for apprenticeships. We use some other job boards as well, such as um, Career Map, Get My First Job, Not Going to Uni, um, job boards that really target that uh, 16 to 24 sort of NET demographic. Um, our apprenticeships, having said that, are open to all ages, as Howard alluded to in his presentation. You know, we are we place candidates of all ages. There is no upper age limit as far as we're concerned. Uh, let me just let Paul in. Um, we will then advertise um, the vacancy across various national job boards. As I've said, the applications are submitted through a simplified and easy to follow application form. So we try to remove as many barriers as possible to apply to application for our candidates that want to apply for the positions. They just need to put in their basic personal details and we'll do the rest. We'll give them a call um, and confirm all the things that we need to. When we contact the candidates, we will then assess their eligibility for the position, first of all, um, to make sure that they're able to obtain that funding um, and then their suitability for the position as well. We don't frame it as a telephone interview. We frame it as um, a conversation. You know, it's a very sort of consultative process with the candidates that we work with. We want to make sure that, you know, they're aware of the commitment around the hours, around um, how are they going to be getting their public transport, et cetera. So making sure that it's right for them and then sort of digging into their motivations a little bit more for applying for the apprenticeship. Uh, we'll then book the interview with both parties and confirm via email. So that's where we do the legwork. We take all of that work away from the employer. Um, the employer then needs to success, uh, sorry, select the successful candidate from the interview process. And then what we'll do is enroll the successful applicant onto their apprenticeship after their employment start date. And that tends to be around three weeks after their employment start date. The reason why we do that is um, you know, we understand that some people that we recruit into apprenticeships, they may not have uh, ever had a job before. So having to do all of their employer onboarding and having to do um, an apprenticeship sign up all at the same time whilst starting their first ever job can be, um, you know, it could be a little bit overwhelming. So we give them three weeks to settle into their role and make sure that that they're enjoying it and that they're ready to sign on to the to the qualification before we ask them to make that commitment. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. So in terms in terms of the things that we suggest, so we've got our vacancy requirements and suggestions there. So um, a vacancy needs to be uh, more than 30 hours per week. If it is less than 30 hours per week, that means that it essentially elongates the time that is taken um, for the apprenticeship standard to be completed. Um, they need to be working a minimum of 30 hours a week. And we suggest 30 hours as well because, you know, put simply, the less hours you work, the less an apprentice is going to get paid. And, you know, we want to make sure that our vacancies are as as competitive as possible in in the uh, sort of ever changing candidate market. And we get the hiring managers contact details, which is a bit of a given. Um, we make sure that we have full DAS permission so that we can advertise the vacancy to the National Apprenticeship Service. 
and we also have a service level agreement and a vacancy detail form um, that we ask our employers to fill out before we advertise the vacancy. The vacancy detail form for obvious reasons because we want to know the job description um, and make that advert really bespoke for our employers and the SLA just to confirm that they have everything in place to successfully recruit an apprentice. Um, I'm not going to read all the time bound commitments one by one, but um, the reason we have those time bound commitments in there is uh, because we understand that the candidate market moves incredibly quickly. Um, for example, the ONS in um, spring 2022 announced that for the first time since their records began, um, there were more vacancies than there were job seekers, meaning that candidates have more choice than ever when they're applying for apprenticeships and or full time positions. So we really want to make sure that if we do identify suitable candidates, we're able to move very quickly in terms of uh, getting them interviewed, uh, signed up, onboarded and all that. In terms of our ways of working, we do not require CVs for level two and level three roles unless it's specifically requested by the employer. Um, there isn't much about somebody who's fresh out of education that can't be said over the phone. Um, and a, it also presents a bit of a GDPR risk in terms of using CVs. Um, what I've listed there as well are all of the sectors uh, that we currently deliver apprenticeships in um, and that we're able to offer our apprentice recruitment service in. Um, and a lot of these um, sort of vary across level two and level three as well. So you've got accountancy, business admin, childcare, customer service, education and training, hair and beauty, health and social care, and the automotive industry there as well. Next slide, please. Cool. So this is a little bit more sort of about the definition of our process um, and, and why we follow each step. So vacancy confirmation with the hiring manager um, is important from our perspective so that we're able to really outline our process, as I mentioned previously, and sort of manage those expectations as well. You know, is a is a consultative service that we have here. You know, for example, if an employer is paying the national minimum wage, for example, or if they're perhaps in a more rural area, we will manage that expectation that it might be slightly less likely that we're able to get candidates um, for that position in the immediate short term. But there are a lot of steps that we can follow um, to make sure that we're driving that local engagement for that kind of vacancy. Candidate attraction, um, so vacancies are advertised across national job boards and local employment centres as well. Um, again, for those rural vacancies is something that we really find beneficial having those contacts within the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, we conduct the applicant screening call, as I mentioned, to determine eligibility, suitability to discuss the apprenticeship and role information. Uh, we offer the sort of end to end experience as well. So, you know, we really want to make sure that each party in terms of the candidate and the employers um, are fully engaged in the process and they understand what is happening um, along every step of the way. So no one's ever left in the dark, left waiting for feedback or not sure what's going on. We want to make sure that um, the parties within the process know what's going on at all times. We do offer outcome support as well, so very important part of what we do. Um, we will support the successful applicants in preparing for their first day of work and their apprenticeship sign off. Um, we work in uh, childcare, so for example, DBS checks, so making sure that they're given over the relevant details for that DBS check, for example. Um, we, support, we support unsuccessful candidates as well with um, careers, education, information, advice and guidance to really help to support them on their career journey. Every applicant that we come into contact with, um, you know, we really want to make sure that um, whatever their outcome, we're providing them with, um, you know, their sort of next step and what they can do moving forwards. It's a free recruitment service as well. Simple as, it's free, we don't charge for it. Um, and we have the uh, integrated and expedited hiring process with adaptable communications. And that point refers back to any internal things that the successful candidate will need to do before they start, we can sort of aid with that onboarding process because again, some of these candidates uh, may have never had a job before. So simple things like uploading a photo of their passport to a HR system before they start and things like that, they're the sort of barriers that, that can potentially be challenging um, to some apprentices who've not had a job before. So providing that additional level of support is uh, is really important and something that we continue to do across all of our vacancies. 
Um, next slide. That's about it from me. Um, you will have my contact details uh, when we send around the slides as well, and I'll pop them in the chat. If anyone does have any questions about what we do here at Paragon, um, or if you just want to have a chat in general, um, I'll pop my details in the chat for you now. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, George. Uh, that's a really good service there. And Paragon, I've known Paragon for a number of years, and they're, they're a very successful training provider. Um, when, uh, when George mentioned the DAS account, that's the uh, uh, digital apprenticeship service uh, account that's, uh, that you need to open um, if you decide to recruit an apprentice or you want to apply uh, to uh, put your existing staff onto apprenticeships. But um, if you contact me, I, I've got all the information to help you to get that set up and, and the relevant links to um, advertise your vacancies. But um, what I do with most employers who contact me, I'll refer them to um, the colleges or uh, local training providers such as Paragon Skills. Right, so uh, thanks thanks very much for that. Now, um, we've got uh, Richard Stittle, who's the Business Development Manager from uh, North Cambridgeshire Training Centre. And uh, it's a fairly new centre, but it's part of a well-established college network. So I'm going to hand over to Richard, who's going to explain about what NCTC offer and the services they provide there. So it's over to you, Richard. Thanks, Howard. Um, yes, NCTC, um, exciting new training facility. We have uh, open in Chatteris uh, in the Cambridgeshire area. Um, part of the uh, Eastern Colleges group, um, same as West Suffolk College. Um, and so uh, we're able to now offer engineering, science, uh, management courses in NCTC. Um, it's really nice for us to have the shiny new facility open and um, we've got an awful lot of uh, inquiries coming, which is great. Um, but uh, coming along today, um, what I'm, uh, Howard's asked me to come along for is, as the title of the webinar, Demystifying Apprenticeships, the same as uh, a lot of other providers, I'm sure would agree with me, one of the biggest challenges we still face is getting the information out. Um, the 275,000 apprentices being onboarded last year, I think if more people knew about the scheme, employers knew how easy it was to set up and employees knew what they could enrol on, that number would be double. Um, every event that I seem to attend, um, whether it's a post-16 school event and the parents are then asking about apprenticeship, not realising they could come on to one, or employers not realising that they can really use their local training providers to do, as George said, all of the legwork. Um, of uh, being there to guide people for setting up um, the digital accounts, for doing the recruitment, for um, helping with the uh, interview process, etc. So um, I'm here today just in case there are any um, questions that come up uh, from um, employers who may be on the webinar um, that we can help to answer. That's brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, uh, Richard. So. Uh, um, do you have a question I was going to say, uh, well, not question really, I was going to say to uh, the employers who are on the call today is that we, as well as Paragon Skills and uh, NCTC, we also have other training providers who, who have joined us this morning as, um, as guests as well. And at the end of uh, today's webinar, we, we will be um, making contact details available to any, anybody really who wants to reach out to the local colleges or the local training providers. Um, so. Uh, just feel free to uh, drop me, drop me a line, and um, we'll, we'll try and uh, introduce you to other trend providers as well. But um, what I'd like to do now is um, really to um, ask um, the guests now if you have any questions for um, any of the, the guest speakers today. If you've got any questions or questions you'd like to ask about apprenticeships generally. And we'll try and answer those questions for you as well. So it's it's an open open floor now to those people who want to ask any questions. But just pop your hand up or. Hi, I've just sort of <laughs> joined Shaz in this one. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, we so we are based in Ely, right? So we've contacted CRC, we've contacted West of the College. It's a chocolate company, so we were looking for somebody from the catering department, um, a young pastry chef who we could come and train here and then we could employ. And we've heard nothing back or saying that, uh, oh, you should have contacted us, I don't know, some other month and uh, we don't have anybody right now. So it wasn't very encouraging. Uh, but 
what my question is, when's the best time to approach and how long does the process take from a college point of view? Thank you very much for that. That's a very good question. And c coming from a college background myself, I know that with a lots of the college courses, they do have uh, intakes normally in September. And I, I've got a feeling, but I'll ask one of the providers, I've got a feeling that particular course will probably come under their uh, catering and food production courses, which probably start in September. But would any any of the training providers like to answer Shazi's question about when the best time is to uh, to register for an apprenticeship? For that type I, of can, course? I can. Oh, excellent. Thanks, George. Yeah, so I think probably why you've been advised that if you went to them quite recently is because during the school leaver period where you're looking around sort of June, July, August, that's when you have people leaving secondary school, you have people leaving college. It's, the, it's basically the end of the academic year. And what that means is that that is when training providers, colleges see their biggest influx of applications um, for the vacancies that they advertise as well as the courses as well. Um, so that that would perhaps be a reason why they would have suggested that that you recruited um, recruited a little bit earlier, probably than have you have done at the moment. Um, uh, is, um, CR, um, Kerry is here from CRC. Uh, Kerry, do you ever take on um, intakes like in January, for example, if you do get any students drop out and then you do a secondary uh, intake it's of students? I was going to say with hospitality and catering, we tend to be roll on, roll off, so they can join at certain points of the year. But because you said the word pastry, I'm wondering if it's because that pathway might not be as popular and therefore that might not be running. But I'm more than happy for us to communicate afterwards so I can look into it for you. But I do think that we are building up the bakery and the pastry. But I'm not 100% sure to answer that question because I know it's not on the portfolio that we have at the moment. But happily support you after. But yes, Howard, they, that area is roll off, roll off. Well done. And also, Shan, I've, I just realised I've got, I'm working with a bakery in um, Cottenham and uh, they uh, were arranging an apprenticeship for them, but they, for their ba for their trainee bakers. So they, they have links with a national food and drinks training provider. So I might actually um, introduce you to the lady from the national uh, training provider that works with the food and drinks. So there may, there may be something that they can offer as a rolling on, on our programme. But I'll introduce you obviously to Kerry as well because uh, so there is help out there for you but sometimes it's unfortunate sometimes it can be the timings as well um because I've got another employer looking for uh, plumbing um but they've, they've just timed it wrongly really because the, the plumbing uh Richard probably back up on this uh start recruiting for plumbing apprenticeships early early part of the year don't you really for, for those types so. yeah absolutely from sometime from April onwards so by the time we get to the start of the new academic year the groups are already uh, already full we still have people approaching now um, looking to bring uh, construction apprentices on now but unfortunately a lot of our groups are are full so we're working on a waiting list or looking at January starts for new groups well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll there's some support there for you Shia, so we'll reach out to you afterwards and uh, um Paul, uh, it's nice to see you here, Paul. Paul's here from Anglia Ruskin University. So uh, did you have a question, Paul? Or um, yeah, it's just, it's, in a way, it was a comment on that as well. I know it's not, we don't offer any of that sort of uh, particular range of courses. A number of the providers will look at September, January. Um, and with us, we also have a few programmes that start in May. What I would say to all employers is there's no harm, and we, we always say this to employers who they come a little bit late for some of our start dates. There's no harm in employing someone early because they get experience of you as an employer. You get an experience of them as an apprentice and whether you want to take them forward on the training program. Um, so, for example, we've had employers have, have hired people six months in advance because it just gives them that period to understand whether it's a good relationship that they've got and they want to take them on the, the training program. Um, so it's just, a, a I guess, a, a additional advice. But don't worry if you've missed a cohort, uh, depending on the opportunity, uh, it can be very useful for that individual to get experience in, with, with you as an employer ahead of starting their apprenticeship training. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. I think El Curry's got a hand up. Yeah. Hi, Curry. Hi, Paul. I think that's really, really good advice. And what I would say to employers, if you did do that, just check on your 
minimum wage because the apprenticeship wage is different to the minimum wage and you would have to start them on that and then move them to the apprenticeship wage but i do think that is a very good idea De de definitely and and it and it's making sure that the uh, the the young person you've employed is, is is ideal for for your company and vice versa to make sure that they've, they've chosen the right career path because that you know very often um i think george you mentioned you don't start your apprenticeships for about three weeks until the apprentices start it gives them that settling in time don't it so uh, uh but uh, yeah really good advice that paul thank you for that um well, hopefully that's helped you shaz um unless you've got another i think your colleague may yeah, yeah. He's got another one. <laughs> yes. uh, sorry so uh wages wise i think it's very clear how does um young people um, out of college um, straight out of college work. but what about people who are um you know just like how it explained that it could be for any age so anybody who's like five years experience and you want to put them uh, on on apprenticeship scheme how does the wages work in that scenario um, the if, if you if you're employing anybody um outside of the apprenticeship age. Uh, first of all, the apprenticeship min minimum wage is, is just a minimum wage you can you can pay an apprentice. But I, I also advise employers to pay above the minimum wage for apprenticeships because I, I, I do think it, I think you've got a better chance of retaining that young person. Young people today are quite savvy. They know they know what their friends are earning at Amazon or they know what their friends are, are earning at another warehouse or in a, in a store. So um, I would say pay a, pay a good a good starting wage for apprentice but if you if you want to put people on an apprenticeship who are um um an adult for example like you said um then it would it would be whatever the the legal minimum wage is for that person um but i again i always recommend if you want to keep keep your staff invest in your staff um just pay pay above the average um or pay the average or or well above the the minimum wage because uh, that that's that's the only way I think I think it's short. I think it's very short-sighted when employers employ people on a lowest wage they can because um, they, they, that employee won't stay long term, and you're wasting time training and developing that person only for them to move on to a better job with more money. So, um, but you can you can take on people, like I said earlier, of, of any age for apprenticeship, but that 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 wage will apply to which whatever age group they are in as well. So. We can share those details with you afterwards, though, so you know if that helps you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I've got Kerry. Hi, Kerry. Thank you. I was just going to say, in regards to when you were saying about experience, um, all of us providers, we would give you an initial assessment, and then that would allow that candidate applicant to put down on paper what they've known and learned before they want to come and work for you and then all of us would come back to you via a funding adjustment or advice. Is that okay for you, Charles? Yep, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, oh, Paul, Paul, we've got uh, Paul now. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add as well that all of the training providers can offer advice on salaries uh, as well because we understand from the recruitment process what works, what doesn't, um, whether you, you'll struggle at certain salary levels or not. So we're, we're all more than happy to offer advice on uh, where you should be pitching your, your sort of salary levels for different roles. Brilliant. And uh, also in the chat box uh, for the employers, George has popped his uh, mobile number in there. So feel free to, uh, to reach out to him. Um, if you've got any questions, um, any more employers would like to ask a question, no matter how, how, how silly it might sound, or we're, we're, we're here today to try and help you to answer some of your questions. But, um, Caitlin, how have you found the event today? Is she there? Oh, you're on, you're on mute. If you'd like to speak, or no, that's okay. Um, anybody else like to ask any questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, Anna Stevens. Hi, Anna. Nice to see you. Hi. Hi, Howard. Um, yes, I have a question. So um, are you able uh, at GrowthWorks to help employers to, um, what's the word, to grow the awareness of apprenticeships and the routes that are available internally? So this webinar is brilliant, um, but I'm wondering how I translate that to conversations with managers and leadership team and individuals within the council that I work for. 
Yeah, we can do that because we have, um, uh, I'm one of a team of four skills and business relationship managers. What what we we tend to do, we'll, we'll go out to employers and we'll do face to face visits. If it's a if it's a small organization, we're, we're happy to do one to ones and and talk to them about um, everything we talked about today, really. Um, but if it's a large organization such as yourselves, um, we'll, we'll go in and we'll talk to we're quite happy to do a, a team meeting, attend any. I'm attending a meeting next um, next week with a, a, an employer and and there's a group of uh, six managers who are attending the meeting and it's really just to um, explain to them about apprenticeships and and how they work because one of the key things I think with a larger organization is um, in order for the shop floor staff to be given an opportunity to undertake apprenticeships it's really key for the uh, senior managers and supervisors to be on board as well to understand how apprenticeships work and and without their buy-in, without their support, um, it, it, it's, it, it could be a failed proposition, really, because uh, we do need the backing of the uh, managers, senior managers, and and and, uh, and we all start. I always advise employers to, when they're looking at apprenticeships, to look at their current um, team leadership and look at where the skill gaps are, are there first, and and uh, to then take on. Uh, put them onto a relevant management qualification, and then if if it becomes um, uh, they, they they can undertake that qualification, we can also then take on some staff in the who report to them, and they can use those apprentices as part of their their, their own uh, training and development. So it's really much about communication and and just spreading the word about apprenticeships and uh, and and often I'll. I think Anne, Wall Anne Waller's on the call actually from Fenland District Council and I was speaking to Anne a few weeks ago and we said if we go out to see employers we're quite happy to go out together so that um, Anne can talk about uh, the, the local district council and what their plans are. I'll be quite happy to talk about skills and apprenticeships so it, it's, it's all about communicating really and um, but yeah, it's a good question. But thanks, thanks very much for that. Thanks Howard. Thank you. Anybody got any more questions at all? Um, oh, yes. Yeah, Kerry, yes. I was going to say to the employers, there's lots of providers all around you who have full time learners who've had time built into their study programs to come and work for you. So they can do industry placement so many hours a week. We look after their, us providers would look after their travel in most cases. But it's an opportunity for you to work with somebody, for them to work with you. And then we're finding that that's the best tool for the right person in the right apprenticeship. That's 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 a good point, actually. And and, and also with Grove Works, we're also looking for um, employers who are willing to act as uh, ambassadors or mentors for um, em employees and, and apprentices as well. So um, there's a range, there's a whole range of services that we offer, as well as um, apprenticeships and and uh, business coaching skills. Um, and again, if you want to advertise vacancies, register on uh, GrovWorks website. We offer a free uh, talent uh, recruitment tool uh, where you can advertise your vacancy on our website free of charge. And and again. Um, you can go on to that, just like George said, you can sift through the applications, shortlist those that are suitable and, and then uh, and then start recruiting. And then the, the, the best thing then is the candles on the cake, if you like. We can then go in and then um, advise you about what apprenticeship is most suitable. And then we can refer you to, I don't know, uh, Paragon or CRC or uh, one of our uh, NCTC. So we've got loads of training providers out there who are experts um, in their own field. So um, there's lots of support there available for you. So, uh, and any more questions from anybody? Uh, so, just before I could, before I go, um, I've got to mention Anglia Rusking um, degree level apprenticeships. They've got a new centre now, a new campus in Peterborough. That's doing very well. But again, uh, apprenticeships I've said earlier, you can do apprenticeships at uh, up to postgraduate level already. And Paul. Paul will be happy to uh, to speak to any employers who are looking for that type of apprenticeship level as well. So um, excellent, uh, excellent. So uh, 
Thank you very much. We've finished more or less on time, haven't we? So, which is unusual for me. So I do a lot of talking about it, but I've been quite good today. I want to thank everybody. I'd like to thank George. I'd like to thank Richard. Um, I'd like to thank all of the employers and the other training providers who've attended today. And big special thanks to Paul from South Cambridgeshire District Council who's put on this event. He's working behind the scenes doing the clicking uh, away. But thank you very much, Paul, for your, your support today as well. Oh, there he is. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody, and uh, uh, be in touch. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.